Uh, Maggie, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I gather you've been enjoying the, um, the fire alarms this morning. Um, actually, the, the best uh, fire warning I ever heard was um, at an event on the uh, 34th floor of the Gherkin in the city. And our host, Standard Life, and Jamie Jenkins of Standard Life, so stood up and said, well, here we are on the 34th floor of the Gherkin. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if we have a fire, we are in a bit of a pickle. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> never tires, does it really, that one? Um, now... My title is to tell you what pensions are going to look like in 2020, 2025 and 2030. Given how difficult it is to protect what, predict what the world will look like next week, that is a bit brave. So what I thought I would try and do is identify three broad themes, things that are going on that run for more than you know, a week or two, things that kind of underlying trends that are going to change the shape of pensions and do a bit of crystal ball gazing. The first is a very familiar one to you all. The move from defined benefit final salary pensions to defined contribution pot of money pensions. Now, I think we're living in a bit of a, a false reality at the moment. Every time you turn on the, on the television or open your newspaper, you hear that pensioners are doing better than they've ever done. David Willett, my former colleague now with the, um, I think it's the Intergenerational Foundation or Resolution Foundation, runs this line that says pensioners are now caught up. Pensioners are as well off as workers, therefore we should switch off things like the triple lock and all this kind of stuff. We've done the job, job done, pensioners sorted. But I think we have reached something I call peak DB. Not peak oil, peak DB. I think that the biggest average final salary pensions the people will ever receive are being received by the people now retiring, and that that will now go down. It's like a kind of inverted U-shape. Why does that matter? Because they have been a comfort blanket for us for the inadequacies of the pension regime we're moving to. If people had 30 years in a DB pension, if we give them a lousy DC pension for 10 years, it doesn't matter. We get away with it. They can still afford to retire. But what about when they've only had 10 years in DB and 30 years in DC? What about when they spent their entire life in DC? Now, the problem with the move from DB to DC isn't that DB is good and DC is bad. It's that we don't put any money into DC. The average contribution into defined benefit pensions was about 20%. A lot more if you had a deficit, but about 20% between the employer and the employee. The average contribution into a DC pension is 6 you do not get as good a pensions if you only put a third as much in. I know this is profound stuff, but you know. <laughs> so, so what are we going to do about this? And why does it matter? Well, last year, I, um, we've started this um, policy paper series at Royal London, and I produced a paper which, a um, bit of a spoiler alert here, it's called The Death of Retirement. And what we did was we said, OK... You do auto-enrolment, you start at 22, you get a full basic state pension, you put 8% in every year through your working life, you don't miss a year, you don't stop to have kids, anything like that. At what age could you stop working if you wanted a kind of gold standard pension, you know, two-thirds of final salary of pre-retirement income or a silver standard or whatever? And what we found was that to get anything like the sort of pensions that people have been used to in the recent past, you'd be working well into your 70s. And if you didn't start saving till you were 35, and of course, bear in mind, there's whole generations of people for whom auto-enrolment has, has come to them in the middle of their working life and they had nothing before, then the pension age, the retirement age, starts with an 8, not a 7. Now, I'm not saying people will work on to 81. I'm saying they'd have to work on to 81 to get the kind of pensions their parents had. And they're not going to do that, so they're going to retire poor. So as employers, you are going to have a workforce that increasingly would love to stop, that you would like to get rid of, or whatever the euphemism is for that, um, <laughs> but you can't. Now, if you mainly employ younger people who are not going to be with you, that's somebody else's problem. But there is a second big global trend going on in the labour market, which is there will not be any young people in future. Now, again, I slightly oversimplify the demographics there, but, but the gist of it is the age balance of the workforce is going to shift enormously. That's partly to do with birth rates, it's partly to do with migration, and it's partly to do with the health of people as we get older. You know, we're living longer, and part of that translates into the fact we're generally healthier in our 50s and 60s than we used to be. So the, there are far more people in those ages who are going to need to work. That's where the supply will be. Employers who are not good at recruiting, retaining, and retraining 
older workers will completely miss out. But pensions is going to be a key part of also phasing that process out of the labour market in a way that works for you and for them. And if all you're offering them is a lousy DC pension on top of a lousy DC pension they had in the last seven firms they worked for, you will never see the back of them. So, crucially, the employer contribution is central to this. And there is plenty of evidence that whereas something like tax relief has practically no incentive impact to join a pension at all, most people don't know what tax relief is except the well-off and the well-advised. Your average punter not only doesn't know what tax relief is, the evidence is that because it's got the word tax in it, they think it's a bad thing. That's the world we live in. So tax relief isn't going to drive people into saving to a pension, but employer contributions, employer match, employer engagement does. That really works. If you say to your workers, for every pound you put in, we put in a pound. Every pound you put in, we put in two. That really works, and it's one of the only things that does beyond compulsion. So governments, whoever wins the next election, um, Mrs May, will have to make sure <laughs> that... Um, the contribution rate for auto-enrolment gets to 8% by 2019. We all know that's not remotely enough. It's 8% of a band of qualifying earnings, so that's about 6% of average wages. And that number probably needs to be 12 or 14 or something like that. So how are we going to get up there? What we have to do is build on the success of auto-enrolment, which we know has worked phenomenally well, and get the defaults right. So people go in at 8 and then we need a mechanism, which works in America, the sort of save more tomorrow idea, that every time you get a pay rise... That 8% becomes 8.5, becomes 9, becomes 9.5, becomes 10, until it's got to 13 or whatever it needs to be. And you can opt out, but that has to be the default, because the painless way of saving money is to put it away when you've never had it. To coincide the contribution rise with the pay rise, and you get a smaller pay rise than you would otherwise have had, but you're not worse off. And because nobody understands any of the numbers on their pay slip... They just get on with their lives. They just budget with what's left in the bottom right-hand corner. So the next government will have to initiate that process. Now, ideally, that would have been started years ago. If I tell you that the 2019 date, which is when auto enrolments complete and we're at 8%, started in 2002 with a dare turner and the Pensions Commission, it's taken 17 years from start to end. If we only start now thinking about maybe we ought to do something about going beyond 8%, We'll have a whole generation of people who did no more than save at 8% and they can't afford to retire. And to be honest, I try not to lose sleep so much these days. But the one nightmare I have is someone comes to me in their dreams and they say, right, Steve. I say, no, Sir Steve. Um, I say, no, I don't, I don't really, just imagine. Um, and they say, right, Steve. They say, right, you set the rate of the state pension. I did, about £8,000, about 30% of average earnings. You set the 8% auto-enrolment contribution. Yes, I did. You set the thresholds and so on. You set out to start at 22. Yes, to all of those. I'm now 67. I cannot afford to retire. Why didn't you fix it? To which the answer is, if you hadn't voted me out, I would have done. But um, <laughs> So um, how, do you, how, are we gonna, how are we going to address this? So we've got to get the contribution rates up. We've also got to think about the, sort of the, the non-standard workforce. Now, funnily enough, auto-enrolment actually works pretty well in some cases. So people say zero-hours contracts. Isn't that terrible? Actually, zero-hours contracts, as many of you will know, the average person on zero-hours contracts does 20 hours, earns enough to be auto-enrolled. And then if the next week they don't do any hours, they don't disenroll, they don't opt out, they don't cancel the pension. It just sits there until they then earn enough and then they pay some in. So actually, auto-enrolment and zero-hours contracts doesn't work that badly. But auto-enrolment doesn't work particularly well where people are kind of changing jobs all the time. So I guess my, my additional trend is going to be that pensions, I think, are increasingly going to be... Now, you're holding up a card that says five minutes, but how long have you been holding it up for? That's the question. <laughs> OK, so... Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll assume it's only just gone up. Um, so I think pensions are going to be increasingly detached from employers. Whereas it was the Wiggins Widgets pension scheme, DB, final salary, you work for us till you get your, your gold clock, increasingly it's just going to be a portable pot of money. It might not even be called a pension. It might be called a long-term ISA or something. You know, it's going to be much more fluid, much less branded by the employer, and potentially taken with them when they go. Because at the moment, what we're doing through auto-enrolment is scattering the shrapnel of tiny little pension pots all over the landscape as people have 11 different jobs over the working life, that's 11 different silly little pension pots, and at some point all that's going to be consolidated. The pensions dashboard 
will help see all your pensions in one place and then perhaps consolidate. So that's another big thing coming in principle in 2019. So big changes. One last thought. How much can we have older workers working? What's the growth potential there? If I tell you that although we've seen a big growth in older workforce in recent years, we have fewer older workers working now than we did at the start of the 1970s. That tells me there is massive untapped potential in the older workforce. Because at the start of the 1970s, people in their late 50s and early 60s on average were not particularly fit, healthy and well. You know, why are we living to 90? Because actually by the time we've now got to 60 and a bit, we're not actually particularly unwell. We're, you know, we're doing less, less demanding jobs, less manual jobs. So today's 60-year-olds are going to be far fitter than 40 years ago's 60-year-olds, and yet there were more of them working than there are now. So what that tells me is there is huge untapped potential. We're going to see a big growth at that end of the labour market, and the employers who win this are going to be the ones who get it, the ones who have the right approach to attracting, retaining, recruiting older workers and giving them the decent pension provision that allows them not just to enjoy working with you, but also to be able to stop when they want and when you want. So that's my start for 10. I believe that there are some questions whizzing through the interweb, even as we speak, and Maggie's going to control that bit. So let me... Um... So I'm going to actually take advantage of this nice long stage here and chat to you over here, Steve, while I invite my panellists to creep up onto the stage at the other end. Right. To keep I'm us gonna... nicely on right. track. Yeah. So we have, as you won't be surprised to hear, a number of questions. Good. Um, and we've probably only got time for one. Right. So I'm going to go with the most popular one at the top here, <laughs> which is that do you think alter enrolment should have an opt-out function and should we move to a compulsory model like in Australia? Yeah, um, I, I do. And although, although the opt-out is, is hassle, one of the reasons for not doing compulsion in the first place, I think, was that the pensions industry had a pretty shocking reputation. And it looked like tax. So you'd be saying to people, vote for me, I will take 3 4 5% of your wage, I'll put it in a product you don't understand, in an industry you don't trust, but it's all going to be all right. And I think that would have been a very hard sell. And now that auto-enrolment's shown us that five out of six people don't opt out, actually forcing that last one out of six, who really, really don't want to be in pensions, many of whom are older workers who, at the moment at least, have got enough pension and so have opted out, just seems the wrong time. So having gone through all the agonies of opt-out, to then say, oh, we're just going to make it compulsory. You know, if we're going to do compulsion, let's do it 15 years ago. I think having got to this point, you know, it's gone with the grain of people. People still have, feel they have a choice. And just one last thought, Maggie. The, the behavioural evidence is people are much happier if they know they don't have to do it. So when we tested the opt-out literature for auto-enrolment, we tried one where we buried the opt-out information on page 64 in Latin. <laughs> and then we tried one where it was in the first sentence of the letter. And we got less opt-out where we were upfront. we put you back in control, we said to people straight away, you don't have to do this, but here's some reasons why you did, and people stay in. So I think if you handle it well, most people stay in, and hopefully the right people will opt-out. That's fantastic. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And, um, sadly, we're out of time, but thank you very okay, much, Steve Webb. Thank, thank you. you.